of darkness is flowing on and grace is torn. Grace and love like mighty rivers holding tears from above. Heaven's peace and perfect justice is the guilty world in love. Who his love will not remember. Who can see One, two, three, four, five, six, testing, yep.
Well, good morning. Let me welcome you to Dundonald Church. If you're here in person, a uh, warm welcome. If you're here online, joining us online, thank you for joining us. If we haven't met before, my name is Mark. If you're new or visiting, uh, you're especially welcome. Please do come and say hello, either to me or uh, one of the other church family. Uh, it's January the 1st, in case you didn't. There are a few weary faces that realize it is January the 1st. Um, let me be one of the first to wish you Happy New Year. And sometimes in the new year, we try some new things, don't we? So here we go. Feliz Año Nuevo. Sehi bog manhi bad isia. Hard one. Feliz Año Nuevo. Shinan kwai lo. And chas livoho nevoho roko. What do you think? Okay, well, look, I'm sorry if your language wasn't there. I'm sorry if your language was there and I ruined it. <laughs> um, well, look, as well as celebrating the start of the new year with these special greetings, we often reflect on the year that's just finished, don't we? So Google, the source of all our contemporary wisdom, says this. Recognize your accomplishments. Um, give yourself kudos for what you did well. Reflect on the lessons you learnt, as well as the knowledge and skills you acquired. Acknowledge your mistakes and missteps so you can use them as a self-improvement tool. Well, look, there's some good things in there, aren't there? But I want to suggest going to another and more enduring source of wisdom, which is the book of Psalms in the Bible, and specifically today, Psalm 115, verse 1. Listen to this. Not to us, Lord, not to us but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. So rather than spend all our time thinking about our own accomplishments, Psalm 115 reminds us to take a step back and look at our amazing Heavenly Father who sustains not just each one of us, but the whole of creation every day with his love and faithfulness. Let's pray. Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. O Lord most high, O God eternal, whose works are glorious, whose thoughts are deep, there can be no better thing than to praise your name and declare your love on your holy Sabbath day. Make today a day of reconciliation between my sinful soul and your divine majesty. Thank you for your love and faithfulness, for the work of your son, Jesus Christ, who makes this amazing reconciliation possible. And help us to start this new year and continue it with your praises in our words and in our hearts. We ask these things in his precious and powerful name. Amen. So please stand as the musicians play. <laughs> Bad. 
King. Oh, glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing. Oh, glory be to Christ. It's great to start the new year with a song that speaks of God's love. So this is one for all of us. Now, I think, Sarah, you're going to do some actions? Okay, so keep your eyes on Sarah. Okay, oh, one, two, three, two, four. Okay. I was going to say stand up, that was fine. Um, we're going to continue our worship together by saying out loud uh, the Apostles' Creed, which is an enduring statement uh, of Christian belief. Um, Christians over many centuries have said the same things. No doubt they've started the new year in this way as well. And as we repeat these words, what we do is demonstrate our own uh, agreement with them. So please join in if you can. Uh, if you're not sure uh, about them, then use the time to listen and think through some of these amazing statements that we make about the Christian faith. So it'll be on the screen behind me. Let's say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. From there, he shall come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. We're going to sing again of uh, Father's love and how deep it is. So please do stand if you're able with me. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only Son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns his face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there. Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that he is finished I will not boast in any No pad, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. How should I gain from his reward? I cannot give a I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom We're going to pray now And at the end of the prayers, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together, which will hopefully magically appear on the screen behind me. Let us pray. Psalm 118 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love is endures forever. Gracious God, we thank you for the good gift of Jesus at Christmas, born to be our Saviour King. Thank you that that is love. Thank you for the year we have had, for increasing freedom to meet with friends and family for special catch-ups and visits, for yummy food, for precious time with church family. Merciful Father, 
We pray for Peter Kamau, uh, Kikungju, pastor at Grace Point Church in Nairobi, who is one of our mission partners. We praise you for keeping Peter and his family and helping them grow through reading the Bible and for the love and care and counsel of friends. We thank you that Peter has managed to transition to give more time to the church plant which he pastors and that it has recently celebrated um, its first anniversary. Thank you that that church family is growing and that there are some who have become Christians and many who are delighting in the good news of Jesus. We also praise you for two apprentices, uh, Regina and Jane, who have just finished their apprenticeship for their particular care and joy in carefully teaching the children. Please help Regina and Jane to continue to love and serve you, our Father God, whether in a paid or a voluntary role in the future. And we pray too that you would help Peter to divide his time wisely between more, sh more studying and also shepherding the church so that many more would hear of Jesus and many more would come to trust in him. Loving Father, we pray expectantly for the year ahead. Thank you that Jesus has done it all, so we can't do anything more to earn your love. Please grow us, though, to see new joys in the Bible this year. Please show us areas where we could change and motivate us to make those changes and help us to be ready to be used in your service this year. And in all things, may you get the glory. And we pray all these things in and through the name of Jesus. Amen. And let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The reading this morning is Psalm 118. This can be found on page 616 of the Church Bibles. It will also be on the screen behind me. Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord. For he is good, his love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. When hard pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All the nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. They swarmed around me like bees, but they were consumed as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them down. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. 
The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die, but live, and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has, has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Uh, morning, everyone, and very happy new year to you all. Um, uh, if uh, you're under sort of 11 and you'd like a, a kid's pack, uh, this is an all-in service today, so kids are staying in. If you'd like a pack and you haven't got one yet, just raise a hand and I'm sure someone will bring one over to you. There's a couple down here. <coughs> uh, in fact, quite a lot. <laughs> Adults, you can't have one. It's for the children. Thank you so much. And there's a couple down here as well. You should find in there uh, lots of things, but particularly to do with Psalm 118, which we're looking at this morning. As those packs are going around, let me, let me pray. Let's pray and ask for God's help. Father God, thank you for this new year, and thank you for this chance to meet together to listen to what you have to say to us in the Bible. Please help us to listen, to concentrate, and to take to heart what you're saying about your son and about us. Please be with us and help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. You um, may not be able to remember what you were doing on Sunday, the 31st of July, last uh, year. But along with millions of others around the country, you may have been watching the England women's football team play Germany in the final of Euro 2022. Of course, you may not have been. It may be that you can't stand football. That's okay. It may be that you're not from England and you're supporting Germany or some other team. That's okay too. I was supporting England women's football team. And for those of us who were watching and supporting them, it was a pretty tense evening. England were trying to win their first ever European final. And it was, as you might expect, full of excitement. Expectation was massively high. Things were tense. The match was one all going into extra time. Um, heading for penalties, which when England played Germany, that's ne never a good thing for England fans. Anyway, then in the 110th minute of the game, Chloe Kelly scored to put England 2-1 ahead. And millions and millions of England fans cheered and went bananas. We've scored! Ten minutes later, the final whistle went. We've won. Except we hadn't won. The England team had. We didn't score. Chloe Kelly scored. And yet every sports fan, or most of us will know something of what it feels like to join in the victory that somebody else has achieved. Chloe Kelly scores, and we cheer... 
We've scored. England win or lose. And we cheer, we've won, we've lost. I say that because that's the idea that lies at the heart of Psalm 118. One person gets a victory that loads of other people get to share in. It appears that this psalm is written by a king. We're not told specifically which king, nor when these things happened, but it's clear that the psalmist is a leader facing trouble. Not a a sort of bad day at the office kind of trouble, more an impending defeat in battle kind of trouble. This is serious. So have a look down at verse 10. All the nations surrounded me. That's pretty grim. Verse 11, they surrounded me on every side. This is a king under serious threat from many enemies. And yet, verse 13, the Lord gives him the victory. See, verse 13, I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. Verse 17, I will not die, but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. But as we'll see, the salvation of this king is the key to the salvation of the people. His victory is their victory. Chloe Kelly scores, we win. This king wins, they win. So from verse 22, the language changes from I and me in this psalm to us and our, as we hear the people praising God for saving them. It's like the king scored, and they're cheering, we've scored. Verse 27, this is the people singing, the Lord is God and he made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. They win because he won. Now the reason the psalmist is writing all this is because he wants his people then and us now to appreciate God's outrageous love so that we'll praise God's name. Thanksgiving is the goal of this psalm. You may well have noticed as we read it that the first and last verses are exactly the same, like bookends on a bookshelf or brackets in a sentence. Verse 1, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever. Verse 29, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever. This is a really good psalm to start the new year with because it would be a, a great spiritual New Year's resolution to grow in our thankfulness this year. I don't know what you're like with New Year's resolutions. I try and have three, two or three sort of spiritual New Year's resolutions. So I try and think, I mean, there are millions of areas that I want to grow in spiritually, but if I think millions, I just get crushed. So I try and work on two or three, keep it sort of realistic. Um, the two I've been, one of the two I've been working on for the last about 15 years is patience. I really wish the Lord would hurry up and answer that prayer for patience, but he hasn't yet. That's probably another one this year. But it's not a bad thing to do. To th- I generally sort of work through the fruit of the Spirit. Um, but thankfulness. Wouldn't it be a lovely thing to think this time next year, well, 2023 was a, was a pretty difficult year, but man, I'm more thankful now than I was in January 2023. I'd certainly love that, more thankful. And this psalm helps us to give thanks to the Lord because it shows us God's love in action. In giving salvation to his people through granting victory to his king. In case it's helpful, here's a one-line summary of the psalm. You, You may come up with your own over the next 20 minutes or so. Do chat about them over coffee. But here's, I think, the main thing we're being encouraged to do here. Here's my sort of one-line summary sentence. Praise God for his forever love shown in our great salvation through his victorious king. Don't worry if you can't remember all that because we're going to work through that over the next 20 minutes or so. Praise God. Give thanks to God. Rejoice in him. Why? Well, for his forever love, his love that endures forever. Well, how do you know that? Well, he's given us salvation. How has he given us salvation? Through his victorious king. To help us 
Uh, praise God. We're going to look at those three different parts of that sentence, that psalm. God's forever love, his victorious king, and our great salvation. Here's the first. Let's think about giving thanks to the Lord for his forever love. That's verses 1 to 4. <coughs> In the first four verses, um, the psalmist is a bit like the conductor of a, of a choir. So he opens in verse 1 by calling people to praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his love endures forever. And then the conductor, the psalmist, turns to three different sections of the choir, if you like. First of all, verse 2, there's Israel, that's the Jewish nation. Let Israel say, and they would respond, his love endures forever. Next, the conductor turns in verse 3 to the house of Aaron, that is the priests or the leaders of God's people. So not everyone, but a specific group. So let the house of Aaron say, and they would sing, his love endures forever. And then finally, verse 4, the conductor turns to those who fear the Lord. That is Gentiles, not Jews, Gentiles, people outside of Israel who've come to put their trust in. In God, people like us, if we're um, not Jewish by background, but have come to trust in Jesus. So let those who fear the Lord say, and our response would have been, his love endures forever. I thought we'd try it. Is that okay? So we're in four. So let's go, these two sides, uh, you're verse two, you're Israel. Uh, this section here, you're the house of Aaron. And you're those who fear the Lord. Happy? I'll be the conductor, if you permit me to be the psalmist in this uh, little game. So I'll say, give thanks to the Lord. And your response is to say, his love endures forever. Okay? Give thanks to the Lord. His love forever. Give thanks to the Lord. His love forever. Give thanks to the Lord. There we go. We've just done Psalm 118 verses 1 to 4. That's a bit what it was like. The conductor of the choir is encouraging all of the people who love God to give thanks to him for his love. And in case we miss the point, the psalmist says it again in verse 29. Give thanks to the Lord for he's good, his love endures forever. Okay, got it? That word love can sometimes be seen as slightly sort of soppy and sentimental, a fuzzy feeling for someone or something. So if I asked you to text a love emoji, you might look at me and think, what? <laughs> but if you did know what a love emoji sort of looked like, you might text a red heart. But actually, the kind of love being talked about here is strong, reliable. It's the Hebrew word hesed, which is not so much a warm feeling as a powerful action. And maybe a more accurate emoji would be this. Or maybe even this. Because God's love is about loyalty, faithfulness, of always being there for you no matter what. Never letting you down. It's about 100% commitment to be kind and generous. And in the background to this word, love, hesed, is God's covenant, his promise. That is his unbreakable, determined promise to love and bless his people, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. One of the Bibles we used to read to our kids when we were younger is uh, the Jesus Storybook Bible. I was looking on the bookshelf. I think it might have sold out, but you might browse later on if you want to get it. The Jesus Storybook Bible, and I really like how it describes God's love throughout the book. Here's how it describes God's love. His never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. So when we say God's love, this is it. He's never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. That's God's hesed love. His love for you never stops. Never stops. Even when you forget it. Even when you mess up. Even when that sin that you thought you'd slayed comes back. And you think, everything within you thinks, surely he can't keep loving me. Yes, 
Because that's what this word means. That's what God's covenant means. God's love can never be broken, not by sin, not by suffering, not by Satan, not even by death itself, the great divider. It's always and forever. And so for the next 150 billion years and more, you will, if you're one of God's people, experience and enjoy God's immense and immeasurable love for you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. I don't know about you, but sometimes I can't imagine why the perfect, holy, powerful God would love someone like me with such a love. But he does. He's told us so in his word. One of the, <coughs> excuse me, little ditties that um, an older lady taught me when I was a young Christian is, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And it's worth remembering. How do you know God loves you? Well, he tells you he does in the Bible. But not only that, he's shown us that he does in his son, if you ever doubt God's love for you, just read your Bible or look at the cross where the Lord Jesus died, bled to death for the forgiveness of your sins. That's his forever love. And so the appropriate response to that is to give thanks to the Lord for he is good, unbelievably good. Now we can give thanks by singing praise to God on our own in a group like this, around the dinner table with our families, we can give thanks by speaking to God in prayer. We can give thanks by speaking to others about how good he is. I've got a friend who's brilliantly natural at just dropping into conversations when you know, he hears of a blessing. And he just says, isn't God kind? Isn't God good? It's so natural. I feel whenever I do that, it's sort of weird and jars. But as we talk to one another about the blessings that we enjoy... Why not remind one another, you know, isn't God good? How kind of God. However we do it, let's ask the Lord to cultivate in our hearts a thankfulness. Because thanks comes out of our mouths, but only because it's in our hearts. And so let's ask the Lord this year, certainly I be, will be doing that, to cultivate in me a thankful heart for his forever love. That's verses 1 to 4. And what follows in verses 5 to 21 is what that forever lo love looks like in the life of the psalmist. It's like he gives his testimony. So here's the second thing. Give thanks to the Lord for his forever love and secondly for his victorious king. That's verses 5 to 18. <coughs> Before we see this king's victory, we really do need to see how close to defeat he was. So in verse 5, he describes, verse 5, how he was hard-pressed. In verse 7, he had enemies. Between verses 10 and 12, he uses the word surrounded four times in the original. Here's verse 10. All the nations surrounded me. Literally, verse 11, they surrounded me. On every side, they surrounded me. Verse 12, they surrounded me like bees. About 10 years ago, <clears throat> uh, three girls were playing in the garden when we heard a huge scream. Now, if you're a parent, you'll know the difference between a fun scream and a terrified scream. This was a terrified one. And we looked out of the window, and there above our three kids was a huge black cloud um, right above their heads. It was a swarm of bees, and it was, it was terrifying for them and for us. We ran inside, we shut the door, and then the beekeeper came and gave them all suits, and we collected them, and it was fun. But initially, it was terrifying. Now, imagine how the psalmist felt by being surrounded, not by bees, but by a thick cloud of soldiers armed with swords and spears trying to take his head off. 
No wonder he felt like verse 13, pushed back and about to fall. If you've ever played chess, you'll know that if you take the king, then you've won. Capturing a pawn, castle, or even a bishop, (laughs) that's not the end goal. You don't want the bishop, you want the king. And it's the same in the battle in the psalmist's day. Kill the king and the troops will flee. And before you know it, you've conquered the nation. So the king being under attack is really bad news for the people. Now, we're not told what military strategies he used, nor about the bravery of his soldiers. The point the psalmist wants to make is that it was God who turned this desperate situation around. You can see it in verse 5. When hard-pressed, I cry to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. Some translations have there, he set me free. Uh, Set free is, is the sort of right idea. Spacious place is the more literal translation. In other words, God hasn't rescued his king and stuck him in a cubby hole. That's not the kind of salvation that the psalmist is saying God's done for him. He's not in hiding. The picture here is of God's king in the penthouse suite, perfectly safe, enjoying God's blessing. And it's the Lord who's given him that victory. And so he says, verse 6, the Lord is with me, I'll not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Uh, In case it ever comes up in the theology round of a pub quiz, Psalm 118 is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. We'll see some of the ways the the gospel writers use this psalm in a minute. But verse 6 is picked up by the writer of Hebrews in chapter 13, verse 6, to encourage Christians to keep going in their faith despite going through a really tough time. So, So that means we can now say, Because the writer of Hebrews uses this psalm, verse 6, and applies it to Christians to keep going. We can now say what this king said then. Verse 6, the Lord is with me. I'll not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? If you're a Christian and a Christian friend's going through a tough time, you can do what the writer of Hebrews did with this verse and say to them, the Lord's with you. He really is with you. You don't need to be afraid because what can mere mortals do to you now that you're one of God's children? People can make your life miserable. I guess most, if not all of us, know that. People can make our lives a misery. They can even take your life. But they can't take your salvation or your security in the Lord. They can't stop God loving you This might sound weird, but occasionally I like to say it out loud to my trial. Hey, what's the worst you can do to me? What have you got? What can you do? You've got nothing on me. It doesn't mean it's less painful. But ultimately, the Lord's with me. I'll not be afraid. What can mere mortals do? I love it when Jesus says in Luke's gospel, don't be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that can do no more. Be afraid of him who has the power to cast you into hell. In other words, don't be afraid of people because all they can do is kill you. That's the worst they can do. They can't take your salvation. For the psalmist knew that God loved him. And he was with him and ultimately he would be saved, which is why verse 8 The psalmist says it's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. In other words, the God that you can't see is way more reliable than the people that you can see. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. So the God you can't see is way more reliable than the people you can see. Now, not that every human being is untrustworthy. You don't need to cultivate a a suspicion of everybody. But it is tempting to put your confidence in the things and the people that you can see. 
rather than the Lord whom you can't see. And the psalmist reminds us that what lay behind this visible victory was the invisible God. See, it's interesting, isn't it? This king could have said, phew, that was a close shave. Oh, thank goodness we had a good plan in place to deal with this, these enemies. Thank goodness I'm so brave. But he doesn't do that. He goes behind what you might call the natural explanation to a spiritual explanation. He doesn't come back from this victory boasting about himself. He comes back praising God for his salvation. Verse 10, in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. Verse 11, in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. Verse 12, in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. It's not just I cut them down, it's in the name of the Lord. And in verse 14, he quotes what God's people sang back in Exodus chapter 15, after God had rescued them from Egypt through the Red Sea. Verse 15, the, um, sorry, verse 14, the Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Well, again, picture the scene. The king returns from battle. His enemies have been blown away. The threat is gone. Can you imagine what would happen if President Zelensky announced on Ukrainian TV that the Russian troops had gone home and given up? Not just for him, but for the world. Imagine that news coming on our screens. That's the kind of feeling that the psalmist has got here. Verse 15, shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. We've won. Or to be more precise, God gave victory to his king, which means his people are saved. Take the king out, you get the people. Save the king, you save the people. Chloe Kelly scores, we've won. No wonder the people crack open the champagne and organize street parties and shout verse 16, the Lord's right hand has done mighty things. Again, it's the Lord's right hand, it's not the king's. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted on high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. Because, verse 17, the king will not die, but live. And end of verse 18, he's not given me over to death. I said earlier that this psalm is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. It's quoted 12 times, three times by Matthew and Luke, twice by Mark, once by John, and once in Acts, Hebrews, and 1 Peter. 12 times in total. And each writer sees this psalm being fulfilled in the Lord Jesus. So whilst the suffering and salvation of this king in the psalm is real and it's historical, these events that this psalm is describing are a precursor to the suffering and salvation of the Messiah, the king, King Jesus. And so when this king says, I'll not die, but live, those words are fulfilled in Jesus. Because even though this king in the psalm didn't die in battle, hey, you would die one day. See, there are two ways of staying alive. One way is to evade death. You can evade death. You may have heard of um, a lady called Violet Jessup. She was a stewardess on the sister ship of the Titanic called the Olympic. And in 1911, the Olympic crashed into a Royal Navy boat and almost sank. But Violet Jessup survived. Seven months later, Violet Jessup was redeployed as a stewardess on the Titanic. Now, when that boat sank, she was one of the survivors on the lifeboats. And you'd have thought Violet Jessup had had enough of sinking ships by now. Well, in 1916, she was employed as a nurse on the other sister ship of the Titanic called the Britannic. You've guessed it, the Britannic hit a mine and sank. Violet Jessup managed to get into a lifeboat, although as the ship was going down, her lifeboat got sucked towards the propeller. 
and she had to leap into the water to, to avoid the propeller shredding the boat and killing her. Now, I don't know if you call this lady lucky or unlucky. Four times she evaded death. But in 1971, Violet Jessup died of heart failure. You can escape sinking ships and dive into the sea to avoid propellers. You can evade death. But you can't evade death forever. But there is another way of staying alive. And that is to defeat death. In other words, to go into it, to smash it to bits and come through the other side. Verse 17, I'll not die but live. That is ultimately true of the Lord Jesus. His enemies swarmed around him like bees. They nailed him to a cross, buried him in a tomb. But on the third day, the Lord raised him to life, never to die again. And this psalm is pointing us to a king who doesn't just evade death. He defeats it. He goes down into it, breaks it, and goes through it. And his victory is our victory. Chloe Kelly scores, we shout, we've won. This king beats death, and we go... We'll beat death. He lives and so his people will live. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Here's another reason to give thanks to the Lord today and this year. Not just for his forever love, but also for his victorious king. The Lord Jesus, who didn't die, Ultimately, he lived and lives today. Here's the third reason to give thanks. For his forever love, his victorious king, and lastly, for our great salvation. That's verses 19 to 29. I think it's helpful to see verse 19 and following in the psalm, picturing a conversation between different groups of people as they go up to the temple. So verse 19 is the king, just back from victory, knocking on the door of the temple. Verse 19, open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. That's the returning king knocking on the door. Verse 20, the priest then says, this is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. Or in other words, come in. <laughs> the king knocks, the priest opens the door. Then once the king is inside... What does he do? He praises God. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. Then it's quite striking. The psalm switches from the singular to the plural because it seems as though there's a group of people who've turned up at the, the uh, temple to join in this Thanksgiving party. It's no longer just the king going, well, that was a close thank you, Lord, for saving me. The people realise that the victory of the king is their victory. And so they say, verse 22, which is quoted five times in the New Testament, describing Jesus. The people sing, verse 22, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it's marvellous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice and be glad. See, that's no longer just the king. That's the people realising what God has done through his king. See, there they are, punching the air, thanking God and praising him. And did you notice what they're praising God for in verse 22? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. That's the thing they're thrilled about. Now, who's the rejected stone in the psalm? It's the king. He suffered at the hands of his enemies. He was pushed back and about to fall. The king is the stone, the rejected stone. But that stone has not just been brought back to be part of the building, saved from his enemies. 
That stone is the key foundation stone on which the whole building is held together. In other words, through the king's suffering and victory, the king has himself become the key to the entire salvation project. Which is why Matthew, Mark, Luke and Peter use this verse, verse 22, to talk about Jesus. Because ultimately he was the rejected stone that has become the cornerstone. The king that wasn't just brought back from the brink of his enemies. The king that wasn't just raised from the dead and will live forever. But the king on whom the whole building, the whole salvation project rests. The rejected cornerstone. See, Matthew, Mark, Luke and Peter, through the Holy Spirit, look back at Psalm 118 talking about the rejected cornerstone, and they look at Jesus, and through the Holy Spirit they go, ha, ha. That's the king that this psalm was pointing to. He's the cornerstone on which the whole salvation project rests. Because King Jesus was the one ultimately surrounded by enemies. King Jesus was the one that through his suffering and victory, his people are saved. He's the cornerstone that was rejected through whom salvation comes to the people. And so the people are thrilled, of course, with this king. And they sing verse 26. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we will bless you. The Lord is God and has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord for his forever love shown in our great salvation through his victorious King. I don't know what 2023 is going to hold. I guess none of us do. <clears throat> I guess we don't even know what the rest of the day will hold. But one thing is absolutely certain, this year and always. God's victorious King Jesus has secured victory for his people. He has. And God loves you. He loves you. He really does love you. And he's shown that in his word and in his son. And so whatever happens to you this year, let's hold on to these certainties. And wouldn't it be lovely to grow together and individually in our heartfelt thanks to the God who loves you and has saved you through his king. Let's bow our heads. You might like to be quiet and say your own prayer for a moment. You may like to make your own 2023 resolution. And then I'll lead us in prayer in a moment or two. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Father, I'm sorry, we're sorry that we don't always thank and praise you as we should. Thank you for the start of this new year. Please help us, Father. Help us to see 
your great love for us, shown to us in the Lord Jesus. Father, please change our hearts to be thankful. Please help us to understand more and more just how much you love us, how much you've done for us in the Lord Jesus, how secure we are in him. And whatever happens this year, Father, please help us to hold on to these truths and to praise you for them. Please grow us in our thankfulness as individuals, as a church, for the honour of your name. Amen. Thank you so much, Letty. Uh, what a wonderful thing it is uh, to know God's love and um, to know uh, the victory that comes in Jesus. And also to know, as our last song uh, declares, uh, that whoever believes in him will live forever. What a great thing that is. If you're able to, please do stand with us. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your forever love shown in our great salvation through your victorious King. Help us to experience and enjoy your compassion and kindness this year, the blessings and the wonders of your love in ever-increasing ways 
so that our lives overflow in praise and thankfulness, giving honour and glory to you. And we ask these things in the name of our victorious King, your Son Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Amen. Do take a seat. Uh, it's tea and coffee going to be served at uh, the hatches. Please stay and chat, talk about something you might be thankful to God for. Um, uh, it's the start of a new year. Why not introduce to someone you haven't talked to before? Do a new thing. Uh, have a great day.
divine all loves excel joy of heaven to earth come down fix in us thy humble dwell all thy faithful mercies crown jesus thou Trouble. 